Hi folks, and welcome to the first video in our week on race and the oppositional gaze. Um, our first video is gonna deal with Mandia Diawara's essay. And think of it as a response to some of the spectatorship theory that we've been reading in the past couple of weeks. Um, so let's look at the title of his essay, Black Spectatorship, Problems of Identification and Resistance. And actually, if you really, really wanna understand the intervention that Diawara is trying to make, we should just think about that title, Problems of Identification. You can think about the essay as posing this question, what are the limits to theories of identification that have been littering film theory since the 1970s? And I think he puts the theoretical problem rather clearly and, and helpfully in this passage. He says, quote, The position of the spectator in the cinematic apparatus has been described by recourse to the psychoanalytic account of the mirror phase, suggesting that the metapsychology of identification with the camera or point of enunciation entails a narcissistic form of aggression, which leads to a state similar to the infant's illusion of a unified ego. That's a really helpful summary of, say, Baudry's point about identification and Mulvey's point about identification, or at least part of it. Then he continues, but since spectators are socially and historically, as well as psychically constituted, it is not clear whether the experiences of black spectators are included in this analysis. So I think we should really just dwell on this point um, for understanding what he's trying to say about the use of psychoanalytic theory. So think about psychoanalysis this way. It has these theories about how human subjectivity is formed. For Freud, subjectivity is the, the balance of ego, superego, and id, or the balance between the conscious and the unconscious, right? How do we come to this, um, this constitution of the subject. Well, for Freud, it has to do with these cultural myths um, and forces in our lives, a lot of them having to do with the mother-father-child unit or with genital difference. Freud's French devotee, Jacques Lacan, will create his own uh, kinds of myths that explain how human subjectivity is formed. One of those myths, which is really important for film theory, is the mirror stage. But I want you to kind of take a step back and ask, wait, what is missing from these theories of human subjectivity? They are indeed saying that human beings, their desires, their wants, their sense of themselves, their lack of a sense of themselves, is psychically constituted. But you could look at this and say it posits a universal subject. What do I mean by universal subject? I kind of mean a subject that doesn't take into account other forms of identity categories that if you're interested in social and historical forces, you would say is a big, big problem. We've talked about this a little bit in class, things like gender and race and class and the way that normative society privileges certain categories such as white heterosexual male as the ideal subject position. Another way of putting this is to say that uh, Diawara looks at these theories about the mirror stage as influencing how spectators uh, identify with the camera and the protagonist in Hollywood cinema. And he says, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. Why do you assume that every spectator easily identifies with this white male protagonist? What about the fact that spectators are not identical? What about the fact that categories of identity, such as race, wouldn't those categories influence the way in which people identify with images of human beings that themselves subscribe to certain identity categories? So that is the major question that Diawara has. In other words, this is his problem with identification. And at this point, I just want us to take a step back and take a, a broader look at all the theories of spectatorship and identification, where they began and how they formed in response to each other. So we started maybe with Baudry, the first major contemporary film theorist to talk about identification in a psychoanalytic way. And he said, kind of using Plato's cave as a model, that cinema makes you a subject, right? Laura Mulvey in 1975 came in and said, wait a minute, wait a minute, what do you mean by you, Jean-Louis Baudry? She said, cinema addresses you as a masculine subject or as a subject in the male subject position, which especially sucks for female spectators. In other words, it's not a universal subject, it's a gendered subject. Manthea Diawara would come in and say, wait a minute, cinema addresses you as a white subject, but black spectators 
can resist. So Diawara is making kind of two responses to Laura Mulvey. First, he thinks that the category of race matters as much or more than the category of gender for Mulvey. And second, that he posits a alternative. He doesn't think that no matter who you are, you are interpolated into this position of the white male viewer. He thinks that there's no way if you're a black spectator, you could watch a, say, notoriously racist film like Birth of a Nation and easily take the role as being absorbed into that fiction. Bell Hooks responds to Diawara and says, cinema addresses you as a white male subject. Black female spectators are completely out of the equation. Notice in Hooks' essay that she responds to both Laura Mulvey and Manthea Diawara and says there's blind spots in both approaches. And finally, though we're kind of going out of order a bit in terms of where we've seen this essay in our class, Caroline Evans and Lorraine uh, Gaiman consider spectatorship and gaze theory from the position of sexuality. They talk about the possibility of a queer spectator. So the first part of their article, they might say something like, cinema addresses you as a white male heterosexual subject. But also, and this is how, this is why I'm positioning Evans and Gaiman at the end of this little history, maybe we should ease up on imagining that we know how all people in a given identity category would experience movies. If you read to the end of the excerpt that Gays were visited, which was recommended reading, you'll find that Evans and Gaiman are actually very critical of this project of identity-based spectatorship theories because they are critical of the idea that we can even be so sure about the stability of certain identity categories. Why is that the case? Because they're interested partly in queer theory. And queer theory, which is a set of philosophies about normativity and about non-normative sexuality, tends to be interested in the way in which identity, especially sexual identity, is not always so stable. So that was just a so that was just a brief recap of a small trajectory of spectatorship-based theories. But now I want to go back to Diawara. So remember, Diawara says in response to Laura Mulvey, cinema addresses you as a white subject, but black spe spectators can resist. So he's not just doing this thing of saying, Mulvey, you forgot about race. He's also positing a new, a new important part of spectatorship theory, a part of spectatorship theory that says maybe some spectators are not easily absorbed into the fictions that they see on screen. Maybe identification doesn't always work so well. Maybe in Plato's cave, some of those prisoners who are shackled to viewing shadows can actually break free from their own shackles. So he'll say, from the, from the specific perspective of my own position as a black male spectator, I want to suggest that the components of difference among elements of race, gender, and sexuality give rise to different readings of the same material. That's the essence of his argument. Specifically, as an African film scholar based in the North American context, I'm interested in the way that Afro-American spectators may, at times, constitute a particular case of what I call resisting spectatorship. He offers um, a very clear and useful and hard to argue with account of resisting spectatorship. He says, to illustrate my argument, I have chosen to begin with a sequence from Birth of a Nation to demonstrate how aspects of a dominant film can be read differently once the alternative readings of Afro-American spectators are taken into account as the black spectator's reluctance to identify with the dominant reading of this archetypal Hollywood text also underpins the protests elicited by a film as recent as The Color Purple. So he goes through this account of the Gus Chase, which is a sequence in which a black character, which is notably and importantly played by a white man in blackface, as are all the black characters in this notoriously racist film, Birth of a Nation, in which that black character named Gus chases a white woman, thus reinforcing the Manichaean dualism between white people as pure and innocent and black people as evil and corrupt. Diawara says, if you're a black spectator, it seems unlikely that you will wholeheartedly accept, without a critical distance, this state of affairs. Now you can respond to this argument in a number of ways. You can say, what about internalized racism? What about the fact that this film, as a very popular object of mass media, might be so successful at brainwashing its audience that in an already white patriarchal world dictated by white supremacy, that it causes internal racism for black spectators as opposed to resistant spectatorship? You can posit that question, but Diawara is not saying that, right? He's saying it's difficult to imagine for such an ideological indoctrination to occur for certain identity categories of spectators. So it's very important to note that Birth of a Nation is not his only example. In fact, it's only a leading example, and Diawara really wants to spend a majority of his time on contemporary, that is 1980s, Hollywood popular 
films that have black protagonists. He'll, he'll make this turn in his essay this way. He'll say, Laura Mulvey argues that the classical Hollywood film is made for the pleasure of the male spectator. However, as a black male spectator, I wish to argue that the dominant cinema situates black characters primarily for the pleasure of white spectators, male or female. So that's one part of his response to Mulvey. He says, to illustrate this point, one may note how black male characters in contemporary Hollywood films, that is, he's actually moving from Laura Mulvey's 30s to 50s to the 1980s, black male characters in contemporary Hollywood films are made less threatening to whites, either by white domestication of black customs and culture, a process of deracination and isolation, or by stories in which blacks are depicted playing by the rules of white society and losing. So he's making a set of arguments that should be very familiar to us um, in 2020, in which ideology critique um, is a very popular way of engaging with popular cinema. Right? He's basically saying that these movies that feature black protagonists in Hollywood 1980s films are still racist, racist in a certain way, in a way that's very different from, say, the films of the 1930s to 50s, but they're racist in a way that they kind of assume that the spectator is white and play to a white audience. So he looks at all kinds of films. He looks at comedies with Eddie Murphy. Um, he looks at this kind of prestige drama with Denzel Washington called A Soldier's, a Soldier's Story. He looks at the Steven Spielberg-directed uh, prestige picture starring Oprah Winfrey, The Color Purple. What really matters to understanding Diawara's argument and how it's so influential for how ideology critique has happened since is that he's moving from a film that is overtly racist, right? A movie like The Birth of a Nation, quite overtly an apology for the KKK, to a set of seemingly innocuous popular movies with Eddie Murphy. And he says that a black spectator who occupies a resisting mode of spectatorship that is a critical mode of spectatorship informed by an experience of American racism, American anti-black racism, will come to certain conclusions that will prevent them from having an experience of identification. So D.O.R. says, for the Afro-American audience, however, this racial tension and balance, which he's, re he's referring to um, one of the Eddie Murphy films here, preempts any sense of direct identification with Murphy's character, because ultimately his transgressions are subject to the same process of discipline and punishment. He is not the hero of the story, although he may be the star of the show. I don't want to rehearse the bits of criticism that Diawara does in his essay. I just want to reiterate what the point is of doing those bits of criticism to show why all of these films are in some ways white supremacist or racist, even though they have black characters, and in some sense, like a movie like Color Purple, have all black casts, and deal with stories about black experience. Diawara is saying that a resistant mode of spectatorship prevents those structures of identification that previous theorists have said applies to everybody as a condition of cinema. So in our next video, we're going to be looking at how Hooks responds to Diawara and how films like Get Out and Illusions might be metaphors or contain metaphors for this kind of spectatorship. I'll see you then.